All right, can y'all hear me okay? Good morning. Um, I'm actually um, I'm actually on campus today. I'm in room S105C trying to do my lecture. This room is a lot different than the office at home. So just bear with me if things are all strange. And I noticed that one of the issues is um, there's a lot of glare from the lights on the on the board. And I will try to figure out a uh, workaround for that. Um, you're able to hear me? Okay, I forgot to bring my mic. That's one thing I forgot. Okay, all right, good. Um, but anyway, we'll see how it goes today. I'm hoping that I don't have the uh, Zoom stop like, I, like it's been happening at home. So uh, we'll see. I know, I know the internet connection is better than um, Some reminders. Exam 1 is on um, September 10th. We'll be at Friday, September 10th. The first webinar is due on uh, September 8th. You do have the lab worksheet on Friday. So I'm going to be here today on campus if you have any questions. Okay? And of course, if you come into the building, you have to, you have to abide by the protocol. You have to wear a mask. You have to, get, you have to make sure that uh, um, you get to screen. And then don't forget, make sure you got your lab kits. Any questions? Are you, um, one person says can't hear me very well. You guys can hear me okay? Like I said, I apologize. I didn't bring my microphone. Okay. So I have a little bit garbled. Okay, I apologize. I, I just forgot to bring my mic. I'll try to get close to the computer to speak, okay? Um, except that I'm going to be too close to the camera. Um, so today what I'm doing, I'm going to do an application uh, or an example of uh, clock synchronization. I want to talk briefly about the twin paradox in an example that's pretty much like your homework. And uh, I want to talk about the Lorentz transformation. Okay. Um, I wrote down on the board some examples of uh, where relativity is used nowadays. For example, in order to be really to explain magnetism, you do have to invoke relativity. Right? If you want to do it right, you want to explain magnetism correctly, you have to invoke relativity. In fact, magnetism is a manifestation of relativity. And we will talk about that later on this semester. If you want to have an accurate GPS, you have to take into account relativity, special general, special relativity, and general relativity. Nuclear power uses the concepts of relativity, not the timing aspect, but the energy aspects. Chemistry, if you want to um, accurately calculate the electronic structure of atoms, you have to take into account relativity. So there are applications of this idea, of these ideas, in everyday life. And the issue is that it's hard to apply these ideas to macroscopic systems like us. Okay, it's hard because we don't go at the speed, we don't go close to the speed of light. And so that that's kind of what makes this subject kind of difficult, right? So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to do an example on the idea of synchronization. We talked about last time that if you have two clocks, if two clocks that are synchronized go right by you, you're going to notice that those two, those two clocks are not synchronized. You will measure that they're not synchronized. In the frame of the clocks, they will be synchronized, but if they move by us, we'll notice they're not synchronized. And I sent you um, 
uh, document um, of that ex exact example showing how, how they're not synchronized. And the final result is the same as the result given in the examples we talked about on Wednesday. If you look at the PowerPoint slide, we look at the slide, and we're going to go back to the, our, our lap clock example. We have the person in the rocket. Shines the beam of light to and from the mirror. And in this example, This uh -huh. distance be 15 light seconds. What do I mean by 15 light seconds? What does that mean? I'm using easy units. 15 light seconds means the distant light travels in 15 seconds. Yeah, I just see it times 15 seconds. Okay, it's, it's simple units. I don't want to write it out in meters. Okay, so, it's 50, so we're going to try to keep it easy. So, the distance from here to here is 15 light seconds. Of course, that makes this spaceship kind of big. Okay, but this is just a, a, an example. All right. So this person who's in the prime frame, because this person's moving relative to us, measures thirty seconds for the time it takes for the light beam to go from the person to the mirror and back. Okay, but did I get that? Well, this is just going to be. 2 times 15c, or the c, it's going to c. That's 30. It's going to take 30 seconds for the beam of light to go back and forth. According to the person on the rocket, now we're standing on the ground. And we observe the rocket go by. And of course, to us, the light beam does this. It's going to take longer. Okay. We already talked about the fact that we're going to measure a long time now because our clocks run faster. So if it's going to take, if this person is going to observe the two events in 30 seconds, what are we going to observe? Well, we use a time dilation theory. Delta T equals gamma, delta T prime. What's gamma? Well, in this case, the rocket ship is going at 0 0.8 times the speed of light. What's gamma? It's 1 over the square root of 1 minus this over c squared, which you basically end up getting this. Of course, 0.8 is 0.64. 1 minus 0.64 is 0.36. The square root of 0.36 is 0.6, which is 3 fifths. And so the cat gives us gamma is 5 thirds. The gamma is 5 thirds and 30 seconds. And that gives me seconds. So, what we say that the two events occur take place within 50 seconds. The time difference between the two events is 50 seconds. 
We're in our, we're, we're on the ground. We see the rocket ship goes by. We're here. And I have a clock here and a clock here. Okay, let's say I have a clock here and a clock here to observe the two events. They're synchronized. So when t equals zero, they both read t equals zero. And then when t equals 50 seconds, they both read t equals 50 seconds. Okay? So we observe well, our clocks are synchronized. person in the rock is going to say, our clocks are not synchronized. And we, and we wrote an equation the other day that describes by how much they're off. I'll, I'll show that to you in a minute. Okay. So, question is, in 50 seconds, how far does the rocket travel? And that's going to be the distance between points A and B, you'll see in the slide there. Well, it's going to be speed times time. So the rocket's going at point C. Seconds. The rocket, according to us, travels 40 light seconds. Or maybe I'll just write it 40 C seconds. I'll write it like that. Questions so far? Professor, I have a question. For gamma, the V over the C is squared, right? When we're solving for gamma? Yes. Can I not write that down? Yeah, I don't think he squared uh, the point A. Even though I said that. Yeah. Sorry about that. It should have been like that. Okay. The so 1 minus 0. 0.64 is 0. 0.36. Square root of 0. 0.36 is 0. 0.6. Speak this. And then it became factor. Okay. Sorry about that. Could you repeat what, what a light second was, please? A light second is the distance light travels in a second. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So after one second, Light travels one light second, I guess. One second times the speed of light. Because I don't want to write one times three times ten to the eight. It gets out of convenience. So are we okay so far with this? Yeah. Now these two points that are marked okay, A and B again are 40 light seconds apart. Now, think about the person in the rocket. The rocket notices 30 seconds goes by. The person in the rocket notices that, even though the rocket's going that way, the person in the rocket can say, oh, we are moving in the opposite direction. We are moving away from the rocket. The person in the rocket is saying, the physics 210 students are moving away from us, are, are, are moving away from me. That means that if I measure 30 seconds for the time interval, then the physics to 10 students are going to measure a smaller time. So if person on a rocket measures the events Take place in 
30 seconds, first another rocket. Let's say B we measure. Over the gamma because the person on the rocket is going to say, Our clocks run slow. The person on the rocket is going to say, Oh, look, the, these physics 210 students who are watching me are going to observe the two events occur in 18 seconds. Even though I think, I think you have it written wrong. I'm sorry. I think it's written wrong, is it? The the sentence you just put up there? It's redundant. If the person on the rocket measures the events took place in thirty seconds, the person on the rocket will say we will measure oh. in thirty oh, is that seconds. Right? Okay, okay, okay. I think I'm just slightly confused. I thought we we're talking about two different events. Like the people on the ground and then the, the people on the rocket. Those aren't two different events. Those are two different observers. The events yeah. are okay, the okay. light leaving the beam and the light being received by the person on the rocket. Okay? Okay, I'm following. So, so, the two events are light leaves here and then light gets back. We can call these either two events. So the light leaves at point A, the light is received at point B. The observers are the person on the rocket and us. The person on the rocket measures the two events to take place within 30 seconds. We're going to say that the two events are going to take 50 seconds. But the person on the rocket who measures 30 seconds and notices we're moving by the rocket is going to say, they're going to measure 18 seconds. What's this time difference? What's 15 minus 18? Uh, the slide that you have on the corner of the screen is blocking the board. Let me make it a little bit smaller. That's one of the issues I'm having. Working at, looking here a little bit, a little bit harder. Thank you. Sorry about that. Can you still see the slide, though? Yeah. Okay. With 18 seconds. So what's the difference between 50 and 18? 32. So the 32, so where that 32 seconds come from? That's the question. Okay, this one second, I need to advance the slide. So these two clocks are synchronized. When the two clocks say, when these two, when, the, when this clock reads zero, and this clock reads zero, I like being the same. When the rocket reads, when the rocket is over here, This reads 50, and the rockets reads 30. Okay? 
Does that make sense? Furthermore, according to us, when the clock here reads zero, this clock reads zero. When this clock reads 50, this clock, this clock reads 50. But according to this rocket, when this clock reads zero, this one does not. According to this person, when this clock reads zero, this one will not read zero. Because this person said these two clocks are not synchronized. They will agree that this reads 50 when the rock gets it. They will agree that this, this clock reads zero when it's over here. They will not agree as to the fact that these two clocks read the same value at any time. Okay. So it turns out that when this reads zero, This will read 32 seconds. Why? When this reads zero, this is going to read 32 seconds. He's going to say, or she's going to say, that the uh, event, that this, this person is going to say that the events take place in 18 seconds. So this will be zero. This will be 32, according to the rocket. And then when 18 seconds have elapsed, this will be 18, and this will be 50. That's where that 32 second time difference occurs. Now, if you use the equation for the time difference, that we derived the other day. Sorry, let me redo let me that. Uh, I need to take a walk in the board. If you work this out, you will get 32 seconds. And so what happens is, like I said, when this reads zero, according to this person, when this reads zero, this reads 32. When the rocket's over here, this will be 18, this will be 15. And it's fine because they're both going to agree that when they're here, these read zero. And they're both going to agree when they're here, it's only 50. If you put on the rocket, it's saying when this reads 50, this is going to read 18. I have a picture of this in, in the slide. So here's a picture of it in the slide. In fact, let me blow it up. This is what the stationary observer, us, sees. At t equals zero, both clocks read zero. And at t equals 50, both clocks read 50. But when the two events occur according to the rocket, when T A equals zero, then the person on the uh, the person on the rocket T sub B is 32 seconds. Our clocks read 32 seconds. And then you say when uh, the light gets back, the clock at A is going to read 18 seconds. 
and the podcast page is going to read 50 seconds. And that's an, an agreement. Hold on a second. That's an agreement with this equation. Now I took this set, I took this example out of actually a textbook. It's not an art textbook, but I took this example out of another textbook. And again, I'm using the lot clock example to illustrate this. And there's a lot of different kind of examples, but I figured I'd be consistent with all the same examples. And I know this might be a little bit hard to swallow. It take, took me a little bit. It takes took me a little bit. Uh, took me some time to really understand it. I'm not doing hard math. Just the logic is is confusing sometimes. I have a question, Professor. Yeah. Uh, could you uh, just explain to me what the T sub A and T sub B are supposed to mean again for both the um, yeah both the diagrams and the slides. T sub A and T sub B are what the clocks read according to us. Does that make sense? Okay, so in the slide, so when it says T sub A equals zero, then T sub B equals 32 seconds, that's the viewpoint of the people on the rocket as they're moving? Yes. The person on the rocket is going to say, when the signal is sent, T sub A will... Our clock will read zero at, at A, but the other clock will read 32. Okay. Whereas in our frame, they're both going to read the same value. Is that okay? Yes, thank you. Okay. Let me check the chart real quick. So professor, what does why would that thirty two not be thirty seconds for T or B? Why does it not be thirty? Yeah, what does the thirty mean? No, 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 on the um, slide. Oh, this one. Because you said that it ends at thirty two. What happens at thirty? Well, this is the, the elapsed time for the person in the in the rocket. We're looking. We're trying to talk about what the. Uh, um, rock is going to say we're observing. The 30 seconds is the time interval between the two events as measured by this person. All right, this person measures 30 seconds, but the whole example is describing what these two plots read. In order for us to say something about the 30 seconds, I would have to talk about um, the, the, the two plots that are synchronized in this person's brain. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to go into that. It's, just, it's basically really going to be hashing the same problem, except using different values. One could do that, one could do it go both ways, but I'm not, I'm not doing that. You're right, it is confusing. Okay, this person, it takes 30 seconds for this guy. Where does that number, where's that number go? But the only thing I need for this is to, the only reason why I need this is to understand what this person is going to say about this clock. This person is going to say that this clock, our clock runs slow because we move by a rocket. So I need the 30 seconds to figure out this routine. So one person asked me in the, Chad, what formula do you use for the point eight c times fifty? Isn't it's distance times time? I mean, velocity times time. I'm just kinematics, right? Isn't distance velocity times time? Pull up the slide again, real quick, so that I can look at it. Which slide? Just the slide that you're on right now. I'll make it bigger. Yeah. Okay. Let 
But that's what the person on the rocket observes. Okay. okay. Thank you. You might need to look through it, the video, a couple times for it to kind of sink in. I, I told you the other day that some of this stuff will make you a little bit uncomfortable. It's kind of, it's different. Okay. And really, I'm doing a lot of this from the physical point of view as opposed to just plugging numbers in the equation. Really, in the, in the end, what you're going to end up doing is using the transformation equations. Um, but it's, I think it's important that you should get to see uh, the physical arguments. If you're, if you're a physics major, then what you'll see is you'll end up having a class where you probably have to go through more uh, physical arguments as opposed to the transformation. Physical arguments that I'm using are much more difficult to work with than this problem. Okay, so there's a there's a lot of classic problems that occur in relativity, and I'm going to spend very little time talking about what the big the big classic problem is called the twin paradox. Um, suppose we have two twins, Speedo and Goslow. Speed of goes to a star that's 30 light years away. They're both 20 years old. So speed of goes to a star 30 light years away. When speed of comes back, he's 41 years old. And Goslow's 84 years old. So when speed of goes So the place is 30 light years away, 30 years, and gamma is 3. This time, Speedo's clock runs slower. So Speedo is going to age less. But Goslow, who's on planet Earth, does not age more slowly. So by the time Speedo gets back, Goslow's going to be eating 40 years old. But if each person says that the other person's clock went slower, who is right about the ages? It's like the rocket problem. This person says the events take place in 30 seconds. This person says that 30 seconds is really 50 seconds. But then the person in the rocket says, if, if my clocks say 30 seconds, then this clock says, this clock is going to say 18 seconds. The same thing with the, the twin paradox. I go, to, I go to, at a very high speed to a planet, And then come back, I'm going to be the same age as you are when I get back. According to you. But I'm going to say that you're still younger than me because relative to me, you're moving away from me. Who is right? That's the paradox. The paradox is the fact that we're both going to say that the other person, uh, the other person aged less. Problem with this, I mean, are we both, are we always in an inertial frame? Are Goslow and Speedo always in an inertial frame during the process? Is 
Is the person traveling always in an initial frame? Yes. But doesn't the person who's traveling have to turn around? And if they turn around, doesn't that mean they're accelerating? So they're not always, the person who's traveling is not always in an inertial frame. You can only this you can only answer this question based on an inertial frame. And so Goslo is always in a, in, a, in the inertial frame. And it turns out if you if you do the analysis, you'll find that Gosler will actually be the older person when Speedo gets back. So if I travel too far away, if I, if I travel to a faraway land at a very high rate of speed and come back, you would, you know, if the distance is sufficient and speed sufficient, I could come back and you'd be the same age as me. Because the person who's traveling is not always in an initial frame. That's the problem with the paradox. There's all kind of paradoxes that take place in, uh, in relativity. So I want to do an example related to this. And really, it's, it's, it's uh, related to your homework. Let's say we have Two physics, two ten students. By the way, I, I saw the note. Uh, that they're closing the campus. Okay, well, I gotta finish the class, so. Um, anyway, uh, we have two physics, two ten students. They travel in separate spacecrafts to a planet that's ten light years from the Earth. Person A travels at a speed of 0.866c, person B at 0.6c. What is their age difference when they arrive on the planet? Now, I'm, I'm not going to take into account accelerations, etc., okay? Obviously, they have to slow down when they reach the planet. Let's say they, 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 they stop in some planets, it's not really This is essentially your homework problem. Okay, so the distance to the planet is 10 light years away. Person A let's look at person A. According to the Earth, how long does it take person A to get to the planet? Well if delta X B delta T then delta T is up at over here. That's 10 light years. Over. When you do that calculation, I'm going to get my When you do the calculation, you get 11.55 years. Okay. 
So, what is, what is delta 2 prime according to A? In other words, if we would measure this time for A to reach the planet, how much would A age in A's reference frame? Well, we have this equation. We want delta T. We want delta T sub A. Now, what is gamma? So V over C squared is just going to be 0 0.866. Again, is about 2. And so I take this number, maybe 5.77. Okay. Now, what about B? What about person B? I have this form here, so I don't. I don't have much space for me. What about B? How much is B? B is going at 26 C. So B will age fifteen point three three years. What is delta T sub B? Fine. It's going to be. 13.33 over gamma sub e, which is a gamma sub e. So what is this going to be? Well, what's gamma? So according to So recap. We're on Earth, we watch person A. Person A gets to the planet in 11.5 years, but person A really ages 5.77 years in a frame. Person B requires 16.7 years to get to the planet, but within A's, within B's frame, really B ages 13.33 years. What is the age difference between them when they both arrive on the planet? That's what we're trying to find out. Okay? Now, A reaches the planet and is aged this much. But now, A is 
in Earth Spring. While waiting for Now, how long then does it does they have to um, wait? What do you think? Well, in the Earth frame, in the Earth frame. This time difference is going to be 16.7 years minus 11.55 years, and that's equal to 5.1. This is really 16.666. So A has to wait 5.12 years until B arrives. So that means A has age. Plus so A is aged eleven point one nine years, but B will have aged this much and the difference ends up being two point four years. Okay. So a will be younger than B by 2.4 years. This is problem number three of your homework. Okay? Problem number three of your homework. Questions on that? So 13.33 is how much B has aged in his own time frame? Correct. Okay. But A is, A is complicated because A, A ends up going back into the Earth's frame and having to wait. And so when you're in the Earth's frame, then you have to wait an amount of time equal to the difference in the two trips relative to the Earth. Wait, how did, how did you get uh, the 2.4 what years again? 2.4 years? I took the, the, the age, the amount of time B age. Minus the amount of time A is. And they got 2.4. So that's a practice. Oh, okay. So B is 2.4 years older than A? Correct. Okay. Again, we're, we're ignoring effects due to acceleration. Okay. That should be stated in the problem. I think now it might get a little bit easier after all this discussion. I hope it'll be a little bit easier for you. And I understand there's some feeling of uncomfortable with this material. I'm not going to talk about the Lawrence transformation. I'm not going to derive it. And in fact, let me blow up this slide. I'm going to talk about the properties of Lorentz transformation and how the properties that were used to derive them. But I'm not going to derive them. 
Okay, I want you to state that. So, here, so when, when, when one derives Lorentz, derives Lorentz transformations, these are the ideas you need to use. Lorentz transformations have to have certain properties. For example, Lorentz transformations have to be linearly dependent on time, just like the Galilean transformation. And it's important because if the Lorentz transformations, just like the Galilean transformation, were dependent on the time squared, that would mean then an event in one reference frame couldn't happen twice in the other reference frame. Because, you know, when you solve the quadratic formula, you get two solutions. Physically, that doesn't make sense. So the ideas that were being used is, you know, based on experience. You can't have one reference frame experience two events and another one is one. Okay. And you can also have acceleration in one frame and no acceleration in the other. It doesn't make sense either. It's, it doesn't uh, uh, jive with Newton's laws. Also, they have to uh, uh, agree with the idea of ca causality, meaning an effect is produced by a cause. Like if you have a wave on a string, and one part of the string is affected by the other sex of a part of the string, for example, um, that means that the, you know, the motion of one of each part of the string is is a result of a force on it. Okay. A cause produces an effect. So, in causally related events have to occur in a particular order. You cannot have the effect occur before the cause. That doesn't make sense. Space and time are homogeneous. In other words, the, the result of an experiment doesn't depend on when and where the experiment is carried out. And also space is isotropic. There's no preferred direction to carry on an experiment. So you use these ideas to derive the Lorentz transformations. You can, and then the other one is you got to use Einstein's second postulate. When you do that, you get the Lorentz transformations. They look similar to the Galilean transformation. And they're a little bit easier to work with than the stuff I've been doing so far, except that, you know, it's a lot of times using these equations that result in non physical things, you literally cannot really think about the physics. Okay, but here's the transformation. This is for uh, really one dimensional motion. I'm not, you can generalize it to 3D motion, but we're not going to do that. So, if you have two reference frames moving relative to each other, let's say along the x direction, the moving frame is always the prime frame. This is y, this is y prime. You see, you got to pull it. Uh, then, if you want to go from between if you want to write the coordinates of x prime, I'm sorry, of x prime in terms of x, then we write the following. Okay? And then since there's no motion along the y or z direction, the y prime is y. And then T prime is gamma is one minus B X over C squared. And then if you want to do it go the other way.
and you get the following. On the right away. So you're linking x prime with x at some instant in time. Remember that each point, each point in space is going to also have a clock associated. Okay, and then of course, if you want to know time intervals and changes in positions, then you put deltas on them. Notice how these are symmetric. Because, if you think about it, if the rocket moving to the right, according to the rocket moving to the left, that's what it is. the sun. And what happens when gamma is small? What happened, what, what happened, what's the value of gamma when, it, when v is small? Gamma approaches 1 as d goes to 0. So what that means is then, uh, check for that. This becomes one, okay? This becomes one, and what that means then is the Lorentz transformation approaches the Galilean transformation. So the Galilean transformation still work because when you're going at slow speeds, it works fine. When when you're moving at high speeds, you gotta use Lorentz transformation. That's why people never notice the problem with them until you know Einstein came along. Because the Galilean transformation worked well for objects that were moving very slowly. Now, if we want to look at time intervals, and space intervals, or changes in position, the right delta x. This still really has to do with the fact that clocks aren't synchronized. Okay. These are these are intervals. And then of course I can I can swap them around. And again, I'm not deriving these in this space. I can also calculate the limit as delta x over delta t. I can calculate delta x over delta t and the limit delta t x goes to zero. Delta t goes to zero. I can find the velocity of the object in a reference frame. I can derive those equations, though they're not hard. Basically, all I got to do is change these to differentials and then divide them. And then I can get the velocity transformations. And the velocity transformations, and again, I'm going to stay without deriving them, are much more complicated. Okay. 
Um, for the for the rel for the relativity problem, to see a question regarding how abstract. Um, you're gonna on the exam. You're gonna be using these equations for the most part for the kinematics. Pretty much like you know you would do maybe in physics two hundred five or physics A. Okay. You're not gonna be deriving these equations. Like this, no. You're gonna be given these equations. For the most part, you're gonna be learning how to use them. But in the homework here. Uh, you really need to learn how to use that. Okay. Which is still not going to be easy, right? Because you have to know what goes where in the equations. Are we okay with this? Okay. Now, the equations for the the velocity transformations, they can be derived a lot of different ways. I mean, uh, and I'm not going to write it. I'm just going to write them down. Okay. So the velocity transformations, they are more complicated, and I'm usually interested in the motion in the x direction, but you see the equations for the y and z direction, and so I would show you all the equations. I have a hard time remembering them, so basically I, I, I have to actually derive them. Okay. So this of x prime is the velocity of the object within the moving frame. Remember the example I, I talked about with the bus? Somebody throws a ball on the bus. So the bus is going this way, which is v. The velocity of the ball relative to the bus is u prime. So that's what I'm going to write down. Okay. And then the other ones, which we don't use very much. Now for the for the for the uh, unprimed, then I would switch this with a plus and this uh, with a plus. And this would be, would be a plus also. Okay. You can you can also derive them by applying the Lorentz transformations twice. It's, uh, but we'll, we'll do some problems with this where you see some interesting things. I don't know if I want to have time today to do some of the calculations that I would like. Okay. Um, I want to do one example. I, I want to mention, I want to show you a couple slides. And I have on Can, I have a, on, uh, I created videos of several of the problems that are in your notes. So let me show you that. And I would like for you to watch them. Let me show you the, the uh, videos. Or let me show you the problems. So, um, if you look in your PowerPoint notes, I have this particular problem regarding synchronization. Using the Lorentz transformations to derive the equation for clocks being asynchronous. This is and this is a video. I, I don't have time to go through it in class, so I made a video of it. You can watch it. If you look in the modules, you'll see I have six videos on this topic. I think, I think it was six. So I have this problem, deriving Lorentz contraction from the transformations. I have a, a, a velocity problem. And I have a causality problem. So I have a bunch of problems on 
uh, canvas and the modules for you to look at. They're, they're like five to eight minute videos. Okay? So I expect you to look at them. And then I will do one or two examples here. I probably won't be able to do all the examples today. I'm going to try to do one of them. Now, what did the transformations tell us? Well, the transformations will imply that two inertial observers will disagree about the distance between two points, which is here. And the reason why is because time is important. We're, we're at, we are in four dimensions now. We've got to describe everything in terms of the x-coordinate, the y-coordinate, the z-coordinate, and time. Two observers will disagree about the time between two events. Two observers will generally disagree about the velocity of an object. Of course, if the two observers are moving, at, uh, are not moving relative to each other, then they will agree about those things. But if they're not moving relative, if they're moving relative to each other, then they're not going to agree about the distance between two points, the time between two events, and the velocity of an object. They will agree about the, the following. They will agree that the, all the laws of physics are correct. The laws of physics will be consistent. They will agree that a body that doesn't experience a force will move at constant velocity. They will agree that an object that experiences a force experiences acceleration, but the acceleration will not be the same. Okay. Two observers will agree on the speed of light in a vacuum. And then the other one, the weird one, it's related to, looks like a distance, is the last quantity that you see there. Two observers will agree on the fact that this quantity is the same in every reference frame. Okay. And I'm just stating that I'm just, just it's FYI. Okay? I just FYI. But the, the first three are important. The, the, the observers are going to agree that the laws of physics are the same in all reference frames. That a free body moves with constant velocity. And if a body experiences a force, it will accelerate, but they will not agree on the value of A. And it's pretty like the same in all reference frames. So, I have 10 minutes. I can do this. I want to do one example. I want to go back to the light clock example. And talk about use the Lorentz transformation for the light clock problem. So let me draw a light clock problem. And I'm going to get rid of the PowerPoint slide. This will be the last thing I do. All right. So We label some things. Of course, in this example, we had the person on the craft trying to line film here. Fifteen light seconds, right? And this thing is moving.
Let's assume the following. Let's let x sub i prime and so this coordinate x sub i prime equals x final prime equals zero. Meaning the location in the location where the light is sent from the person to the mirror is x prime equals zero. And of course, the two events of sending the beam and receiving the beam occur at the same location in the rocket. And so I'm going to say x initial prime equals x final prime equals zero. That also um, coincides with this guy. Wouldn't it be y initial equals y final because the, the light's coming back to the same point on the y axis? Isn't it going to the same point on the x axis? It's moving in the y direction, isn't it? Doesn't light you go through this? Oh, okay. Right? But this coordinate, according to the person on the rocket, stays the same. According to us, it doesn't, but the person, the person on the rocket stays the same. Okay. Right? And I'm, and I'm more interested in the X motion than the Y motion. So that's why I'm not saying anything about the Y direction. Because I'm going to talk about what, this, what, the, what we observe. This is us. Okay. And by the way, uh, I want to calculate the damage factors. Okay. So there's a clock here. A clock here. Okay. And I want to also write that x of a occurs at zero. And the time it takes delta t prime, you remember, is 30 seconds. Which means that t prime is 30 seconds because we only change the shape to zero. So I want to figure out the location of shift according to x. Right, when, when this reads zero, this will reach zero. What is the location of the shift according to us when t equals 30 t prime equals 30 seconds? So I use the Lorentz transformation. What is x final according to the spaceship? According to the spaceship, the light beam comes back in the same place, right? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, so this is zero. And T prime was 30. Okay, so 30 times point A is 24, 24 times 5 thirds is 3 thirds. Okay. 
Good text by this one. Does that agree with what we had before? And, and, and by the way, Michael, yeah, the light's moving in the y direction, but the, the rocket is moving in the x direction. Does that agree with what we had before? The location of shift is one of those with P prime equals zero. What else can we? Okay. What is the clock reading at B So to clarify, the 40 light seconds is yes. the X um, component of what the observer us measures as the light? Correct. Okay. When the rocket's here. So that would be like the the triangle, I guess? Yes. Well, okay. I mean, this, that's when the, when, when the person's here. It's, it's not... It's this distance. This is okay. here to here. Thank you. Because remember, we saw the event take place in 50 seconds, 50 times 28 is 40. But I'm going to be using the Lorentz transformation. Okay, so what is the clock reading here? Using Lorentz transformations. What is TCP? Can I use Lorentz transformations? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I want to know what this clock reads when the spaceship gets there. Gamma is 5 thirds, right? T prime is 30 seconds. What's X final prime? Where does this come out to be? Okay. What does the rocket ship say about the clock at B? What does the rocket ship say about the clock at B when the rocket ship sends a signal? So,
What does the prophet say about our clock being the key when we say we will sin? And I'm going to use this one. I want to write in terms of the following. So it's a human show. When the signal is sent, it's a zero. We want to know what this reads when this guy is zero. The clock is at this location. And this location is 40. And you got to solve the piece of ID. And if you do that, you get two survive. It's going to be two seconds. Again, an agreement would be from saying this one. The observer in the rocket says that the clock at least 32 seconds ahead of the possible. Okay. So I, I kind of got give you uh, an idea of how we can use these equations to do various calculations. Um, then you'll have also examples where you look at time intervals. You look at like delta T, for example. So why are you defining um, T prime initial as T prime initial? Wouldn't it be T prime uh, final, like at that B marker? When the signal gets back? Well, I want to know what this reads when I send a signal. Right? Oh, okay. So that's when it starts? When it from starts. From at when B? Back. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? You can also ask, you know, what does the rocket observer say about the clock at A? When the rocket's over here. You should get 18 seconds. You can do that one too. As you progress, the last uh, Lecture on this topic it might go a little bit more than a class period. Will actually be easier. It's on energy and momentum, and I've always found I've always found the energy and momentum problems to be easiest. And you will find when you apply relativity, most of the time you apply relativity, it's for doing energy and momentum problems, unless you can go to general relativity. But, um, most of the problems we are going to solve involve conservation of energy and momentum. Those are actually fairly straightforward because you've done conservation of energy and momentum in uh, Physics 205. The problems are very similar. And so you'll find it, it, it does get easier. Again, it might look kind of weird right now, but it gets easier. But the last lecture uh, will be, I think, easier for you guys. I'm probably, I might do one more example on this topic. But um, when we get to conservation of energy momentum, you'll we'll find that um, it's really con uh, momentum conservation, energy conservation at the same time. Those problems would be uh, easier to work with. They're, they're actually more mathematical. Conceptually, I think they're easier, at least from my point of view. Right. So I'm going to stop here. Um, how did this work doing this here as opposed to? I know I know that the uh, zoom never froze, but how does this work for you? I thought like I did a lot better. This is and better. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I it out a little bit, but I mean, that's just that's just gonna happen sometimes. So. I mean, I have trouble because of the fact that I have to. Uh, I, uh,
it's harder here because the board gets covered from my PowerPoint, so I have to, it's hard for me to see. At home, I, I have it set up so that uh, it's easier for me to avoid the PowerPoint. So, okay, if it was better, then I'm going to keep trying to come here a little. I'm supposed to leave, but I don't know if the campus is closed. So I guess you guys can come here today. Yeah, the audio was hard to hear. That was my fault because I forgot my microphone. I forgot to bring my microphone. I'll bring my microphone next time. Okay? All right, then. I'll see you guys. Um, I'll try to upload this video. Oh, yeah, I didn't upload the second lab, the video from the second lab the other day because um, I had a lot of problems with it. I will upload it, and I also have to make a change to it. But the other two lab lectures are on YouTube, and even if you're not in that section, you can still watch them. All right, uh, we'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you, Professor. Goodbye. Thank you, Professor. Professor. Professor.